My name is Chris Forsberg, Formula Drift champion. Been driving in Formula Drift for 16 years now and overall drifting for about 20 years. first got into cars or motorsports around like 10, 11 years old. My uncles were really into drag racing. Went out to Maple Grove a couple times, went to some top fuel races. My grandfather was into drag racing as well. Slowly but surely, uh, as I turned 14 and 15, when my brother got his license and they were starting to uh, get cars and modify them, I was working with them in my parents' barn, slapping on turbo kits or even like putting in stereos. Um, just trying to really figure out what it was to modify a car. My first drift car, it was a 1988 Mazda RX-7, and I got it specifically to try and make a drift car. Uh, my friend told me about rotaries and how kind of crazy and loud they were, and so I was kind of hooked on it. And then I dragged it out to California for the D1 driver search that we learned about in 2003. And at that point, you know, we come out to California and we see you know, the big tents, all the companies, you know, everybody that we're like seeing in magazines and all the companies we see in magazines. I knew that if I didn't kind of pack up and get out to California where the scene was kind of exploding, that I was gonna miss a wave. And so I actually come back from that event, which I failed at horribly, didn't make it past first round, <laughs> and sold the car, sold a bunch of stuff, and I picked up a Nissan 350Z. It had just come back to the market uh, in 2003. And I felt that getting a car that was going to be new and flashy and not just another 240 would help me stand out in that crowd. You know, I actually made payments on that car through the first five years of Formula D that I had that thing. But yeah, that was um, the car that kind of helped project me into uh, professional drifting because as I arrived to California with this brand new Z, people were kind of looking at me to say like, you know, who is this guy? And it was also easier to work with some companies because we had a car that they wanted to develop parts on. After I sell all my stuff, get a 350Z, move to California uh, with you know no house or anything lined up. I was like living in uh, a hotel for a few days. My, my target was there was a, a drift show off event in October. So I get out there and I actually placed fifth in the event and that kind of like stirred up some attention and I started to meet some of the companies when I was there. And only a month later, was um, the SEMA show 2003 where Formula Drift announced the Formula Drift North American Championship at SEMA. And I was like, this, this is it, this is what I'm here for. And you know, like it's all kind of falling into place. And I got a new tire sponsor and I got a new title sponsor and got myself lined up to run the full season Formula Drift in 2004 where we got out to Road Atlanta and I placed second in the first event ever and then followed up with a third place finish in Houston. So. Um, two podiums um, out of four, and uh, third place overall in the first year of FD. Yeah, oh, I was 21. <laughs> I'm uh, living in a garage, um, you know, working in a shop on the weekends to try and make some extra money. And, um, you know, we're just like having fun with our friends. Like, we didn't really have much of a care in the world. You know, you fast forward 16 years later and, you know, here we are with a, you know, big shop doing projects, doing builds. The cars are more insane than ever. And, um, you know, never at that time um, at those first events did I think that it would turn into this. It, um, it just seemed like it was just going to be like kind of like quick in and out, like a fun fad. Um, obviously, we wanted it to progress and to grow, but I just honestly didn't really think it would. It's funny because right after that is when my career almost ended. I actually lost my sponsor and as we went into the year, we only had enough budget to make it to like the first two or three rounds. We just went out with, I don't know if it was a termination. We podiumed um, three or four rounds that year, three rounds. And um, so we were actually paying our way through FD off the winnings and um, with every with every win, we had enough money to go to the next round and to keep going and going. And we finished second. And just that effort and determination um, landed us our primary sponsorship with NOS for 2008. You know, none of us had any idea where we're going with this. We were basically trial and erroring these cars every season. And so um, every year, like you'd have someone with a new theory and it was about trying to catch up to that idea. And so it's just funny. It's just been like, you know, cat and mousing for the past, 
15 years. Where we are now is, is very, very impressive to watch. So some of the changes that we're doing to the car, um, as I mentioned, there's like just huge progressions in drifting every few years. And what it seems like now is it's all about the consistency and smoothness and being able to run um, very tight tandem against any driver in all conditions. And so where we were really leaning on getting the speed and the drive um, out of our car to have the ability to keep up with everybody, um, that doesn't exactly matter unless you have the ability to mimic the same angle. And so what we did was I took everything out of the back of the car to try and um, compress the weight over the rear axle where we had, I would say, um, almost 200 pounds of weight behind the rear axle. And now we have about 60 or so. Um, everything else is on top of the axle. We're trying to um, limit the amount of pendulum effect that the car will have, which means, yes, when you're on the throttle and you have that leverage of the weight behind the axle pushing down, you get a lot of traction, get a lot of speed. But when you throw the car to a big angle or you're in a decel area, you have all this extra weight behind you and the car just wants to sail and you're not really getting the car to hook up. And so our most successful years was basically that old configuration where we had all the weight um, over the axle. We've been running AEM sensors on our um, competition car for the past uh, five years or so, um, maybe longer. And over the years, we've been um, applying more and more AEM products to the car. And we are now starting to see a, a variance in um, the actual power output on the V motor, right? So we're having more output on the one bank versus the other, and we're actually seeing that in the logs. And so AEM came out with a uh, multi-channel EGT unit that we can plug into our race harness. It'll give us the ability to plug six individual EGT sensors into each exhaust runner, so we can actually see the output of each cylinder and be able to trim each cylinder to get the engine working as smoothly as possible. And so what that will do is just give us even more reliability with our engine, which is what we need to make sure that we have a competitive season because mechanical failures are the one thing that will end a championship year. If you blow a motor in the middle of a competition, chances are you're not gonna win a championship that year. One of the most visual changes we're making to the electronic side is the AEM CD7 dash, which is awesome because it is not only um, larger than my previous dash, which gives me uh, more room to have the right sensors and outputs and displays that I wanna see before, during, or after a run. It's also very easy to configure. It's very user friendly. And we have it now wired in um, to not only see the new uh, K-Type EGT outputs that we're adding to the engine, but also all of the MoTeC um, sensor and uh, outputs are being pushed through the dash. Of course, it also communicates with our new VDM, which is the AM Vehicle Dynamics module, which reads GPS speed, G-loads, yaw, all the things that we want to learn from a drift car so that when we are playing with the suspension and even the power output, tire pressures, all of those things to have the car operate the way we want it to around the track, we can actually see those changes and how um, you know they're either getting better or worse, not only in certain parts of the track, but just overall in general between rounds, between years, between moving setups around in the car and giving us the ability to see the progression as we continue to see AM push and develop better products. We're applying more and more of those products to our competition vehicle and hoping that these new products that we're adding this year give us the edge that we need to not only have a more reliable engine, um, but also more control and ability to set up the car with the VDM box. And we are now in the process of building a new demo car, which is going to be VR powered and we're actually gonna run that on the AEM Infinity box and actually have the exact same um, setup and drivetrain from our competition car in the demo car, and we'll have one running on the MoTeC through all the AEM sensors and displays and um, the VDM and everything else, and the other car will be uh, completely on the AEM system. And so I'm excited to see how um, those two cars compare. That was pretty wordy. <laughs> I'm sure you can cut that down. <laughs> So we show up to Palmdale, get the car warmed up, ready to go. We make a pass, 
And lo and behold, the very first pass out, not even with the boost turned up or me even trying, it goes like a nine something. And we're like, wow, this is uh, turning really interesting. Go back to the pits, look at the data, make a